You know, English is one of those languages that can be quite difficult to figure out sometimes because some words have multiple meanings, right? And we call those words homonyms if they're spelled the same and if they sound the same, but they mean something different. So, for example, if I say the word book, how many of you here think of something with pages in it that you read? Raise your hand if that's what you think of when I say the word book. Or how many of you... When you hear the word book, think of the act of making a reservation, like you're going on vacation, you got to book a room at a hotel. How many of you think of that? How, how many people here think of the uh, when I when I mention the word book, think of like you're you're preparing to go to jail because you've been arrested, you know, like book 'em, Dano, <laughs> right? Okay. So that's an example of a homonym. Well, we are in a message series called 2020 Vision, The Intentional Church. And what we're doing here over these weeks together is gaining a clear vision for what an intentional church looks like. This series is challenging our preconceived notions of what church is. And I hope that maybe it's leading you to, you know, believe the truth of what the church is really all about. I hope that it is leading you to maybe get more engaged, right, with the church and its service and its work and to really realize that, you know, God isn't looking for perfect people who have their act all together. Rather, he is looking for people who are willing to do whatever it takes to connect folks to Jesus and one another. And when the church is intentional, it also worships joyfully. So today we're going to talk about a word that is technically not a homonym, but it often has different meanings nevertheless. We're going to talk about the word worship, and this word worship can mean so many different things to so many different people. Uh, some people might think of worship as the singing time, right? When we stand up on Sunday morning and we, we sing songs, um, and, and that is part of worship, but it's not the only part of worship. It's not all what worship is. Others might think of worship as a place. It's like the church, like I'm going to worship, right? Meaning it's a place. So others might think of worship as that time when we share together in the Lord's Supper. Or maybe it's, you think of worship as that time when the preacher stands up and he, and he gives his message. Well, you know, when it comes to worship... It can mean a whole lot of different things, but for some people, maybe worship isn't really even taken very seriously. In fact, someone once said, most people tend to worship their work, work at their play, and play at their worship. <laughs> and what they mean by that is, you know, sometimes we tend to put more energy and commitment into our recreation and entertainment and jobs than we do into worshiping the Lord. The word worship, it means to ascribe worth. It means to ascribe honor. And so when you are worshiping God, you are ascribing worth and honor to him. Now, what you are doing in worship is you are saying to God, you are worthy of my praise. Colossians 3.16 says, Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms and hymns and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. Today I'd like to encourage us to maybe step it up in our worship in at least three ways. How can we step it up in our worship? Well, first of all, we can step it up by understanding that worship energizes your faith. You know, when those little kids are down here marching to, to that music, I mean, they are energized, right? And they are worshiping God and they are, are feeling his presence. Worship energizes your faith. The, the first Christians, they had access to the Old Testament, but they didn't have access to the New Testament because it was still being written at that point. The way that the life and ministry and teachings of Jesus was passed along to people was verbally, and sometimes his teachings were set to music. You see, those songs that followers of Jesus sang in the early church, they were, they were an important part of education, 
just as they were for worship. And that is still true today. We sing of Christ's character and we sing of Christ's work when we sing and worship in that sense. Our singing on Sunday mornings isn't just mere fluff. It is, it is worship that reminds us of what we believe and it helps us to remember it, right? I mean, I can tell you, I will go home and all week long I will be singing these songs of worship. I was sharing with Dave uh, the other day that, you know, some of the songs we sang last week, I was singing them all week long. And it's just reminded me of who our Lord is and what it means to live for him and to serve him faithfully. And so our singing, it sticks with us, doesn't it? It sticks with us throughout the week. It allows God to influence us so that our worship is exciting and fulfilling rather than weak and forgotten. Our time of singing and reading the Bible and sharing in the Lord's Supper together, it leads us to celebrating the victory that we have in Jesus Christ. Now think about this. You know, when you win something, maybe you win at a game of Settlers of the Catan, or maybe you win in a hand of euchre or rummy, or maybe you win a whopping five bucks in the lottery ticket, right? Nobody has to tell you how to celebrate, do they? I mean, you fist pump into the air, and you, you shout and cheer, and you clap your hands, and you pat people on the back, and you jump up and down. When you win at something, you become enthused. When you win at something, you become excited and alive. I remember one year during our VBS, one of the games involved leaf blowers and toilet paper. <laughs> now, before you get worried, because I can see anxiety on some of your faces right now, the toilet paper was unused, okay? So, anyway, the way this game worked was uh, you, you slid a roll of toilet paper onto a broomstick, and there was two people on each side of that broomstick handle, and they would... They would hold that up in the air. And then the contestants, and, and standing next to them was another kid, right? And they were, they were doing the same thing. And, and so the, the contestants would fire up the leaf blowers, or the adults would do it for them, and they had to unroll that toilet paper by aiming that leaf blower just right so that it would catch the, the paper, and then it would, it would turn the, the toilet paper roll, and it would unroll. And the winner of the game was the first one to get all of their toilet paper unrolled. Well, I wasn't privy to watching the games because I was inside the church building, and I was teaching the lessons and doing other stuff. And at the end of the night, we all met outside on the back parking lot at the end of the program, and, and I saw the leaf blowers. They were sitting over there by the basketball hoop, and there was some toilet paper sitting down there. And I, and I thought, wow, that... I'd like to try that. And so I asked if I could try it, right? And, and they explained to me how it worked and what I had to do. And I, I really didn't think it was going to be that big of a deal. I didn't even really think that it would work all that great. So two people raised the broomstick. It had that roll of toilet paper on it in the middle. And I fired up the leaf blower. And I aimed it at the toilet paper. And let me tell you, that thing worked great. It was so fun. You know, uh, that roll of toilet paper started spinning wickedly fast, and, and, uh, and the wind caught the paper just right, and it went like a mile up in the air, and it's going, and the kids are shouting, and they're jumping up and down, and they're trying to catch it and everything. And me, what was I doing? I, I tell you, I, I got to confess here, I was like a maniac unleashed, right? I'm out of control. I'm shouting at the top of my voice, woo -hoo! Ooh, yeah, <laughs> and uh, and I was like a wild man or something. And I remember uh, Lynn Pride. You know, this is when Jeff was our youth minister, and and the Prides were here with us. And Lynn, she's she's standing off to the side, and I could hear her going, "I've never seen Tyler like this before." <laughs> <laughs> I think I might have scared her a little. I don't know, but. You know, when we celebrate, nobody has to tell us how to do it. Now, now I get it that we all express ourselves differently. Not everyone expresses their successes and wins by jumping up and down and yelling and getting all crazy. I mean, that'd be my grandkids, right? But, but some people, they celebrate exuberantly and, and with a lot of expression. And other people, they celebrate and they're more docile and reserved and I really don't think we should judge people for how they express their celebration. You know, I've been to worship services before where 
people would raise their hands during the songs and they'd say, Amen, you know, when, when I'd make a good point. And then after the worship service, I'll be standing out there and someone will come up to me and they'll say something like, whoa, whoa, whoa I hope we're not becoming like one of those Pentecostal churches now. <laughs> right? <laughs> Seriously, that's happened. Or I've been in a worship service where, you know, the singing was dynamic and the preaching was spot on, and, but nobody hardly reacts to any of it. And they're not saying anything. They're just sitting there, right? And at the end of the service, someone will come up to me and and I'll be standing out there and they go, sheesh, you know, if people would just get excited about Jesus, we could really rock this place. <laughs> Listen, what matters isn't so much how we express our celebration. What matters is that our celebration is from the heart, right? However you express it. Isn't that true? That's when worship will energize your faith, when it's coming from your heart, no matter how you express it. You ever wonder how it makes God feel, though, when he's looking down at you and, and he sees how excited and energized you become when you're watching your favorite sports team play the big game, right? We get excited about that. Or, or what about when you're playing video games? You know, sometimes we get pretty excited about that. We have a Wii at our house. Do, you, do any of you know what the Wii is? It's like a video game. I know it's ancient, you know, compared to all the new stuff that's out there right now, but... But on our Wii, there is this tank game, right? And for me, it is so challenging. I tell you, I struggle getting those buttons because you got to press the right buttons to make the tank turn or advance. or to, you got to press the triggers to shoot it or make it, you know, set a mine in the ground. What I do is I press the wrong buttons, and I'm like unloading all these mines in the ground. Then I back up and blow myself up. But man, let me tell you, it feels good when I get it right. And, and, and I fire that gun turret, poof, and you can see the shell going across the field, and it hits that other tank, that enemy tank, and boom, it blows up and makes that sound. And I'm dancing, and I'm going like, I got this, I got this, I got this, <laughs> right? <laughs> now, now, the truth is, <laughs> the truth is I'm usually playing with my grandson, and he's really good at moving the tanks around, and he's got great coordination with that stuff. And, and the thing with, with Garen, he, he always likes to play teams, right? So we, we are a team, and we, we gang up against the enemy tanks. And when you, when you blow all the enemy tanks up, then you go up to the next level, you know, and it gets harder and harder. And, uh, you know, and it's fun to do that. But I have to say, sometimes I don't know what gets into him. He'll turn his tank against me and blow me up <laughs> on purpose, the little stinker. Anyway, when, when, when he's not demon-possessed, though, <laughs> we do pretty good together. And we do a lot of shouting and cheering and fist bumping and all that kind of stuff. But here's the thing. I, I sometimes wonder to myself, does God ever look down at me and when I'm getting all excited, you know, over we, the Wii Tank game, and then say something to himself like, man, I sure wish he'd get as excited about worshiping me as he does playing that silly old video game. <laughs> you know, and, and I'm not just picking on gamers this morning, because um, for you it might be something different that gets you energized. It might be something different for you that gets you excited. Maybe it's getting out the golf clubs, or maybe it's getting out the fishing pole, uh-oh, now I'm stepping on some toes, aren't I? Or maybe it's, you know, getting packed for vacation or going up to the cabin or going to the campgrounds. Maybe for you, what gets you excited is getting out the motorcycle or getting out the boat or the snowmobile. Maybe the thing that energizes you and excites you is the thought of going shopping, right? Going shopping. MasterCard, take me away. Remember those commercials? Or maybe it's building or remodeling your house, or maybe it's eating out at your favorite restaurant. And the question God might be asking you at those times is, why don't you get as excited about worshiping me as you do with all those other things that have zero eternal value, right? When we are worshiping together, 
there ought to be a certain amount of excitement that you feel, whether you are more expressive or whether you are more reserved. Because we have won this great victory through what Jesus did on the cross and in his resurrection. God saved your soul. And it's only a natural thing to feel joy when you worship him. Worship clarifies and it reminds us of the truths of God when the enemy's lies come upon us. Sometimes I know that life is hard and I know that life is sad, but I worship because I know who God is and I trust in what he will do. And things might not be right in the world right now, but he will make it right again someday. Psalm 95, one says, Come, let us sing for the joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. That's why we worship him. He is rock solid in that he is immovable in a world that is so often crumbling and falling apart around us. But God is trustworthy. Psalm 100, verses 1 and 2, it says, Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. You might not think that you're a very good singer. But what we see here from the psalmist is that Worshiping the Lord joyfully is more about your attitude and your heart than it is about the quality of your singing. We worship him joyfully because God is good and his love endures forever. And when you do that, it will always energize your faith. Here's a second way to step up your worship of God, and that is use worship as a witness. It's a witness to those around you of what God has done in your life. It's a witness of what God is doing in your life. It's a way to express his story of faithfulness to you. You know, when worship is a priority to us, it speaks to God's power and presence in you. And so, for example, you know, if you're having relatives or guests spending the weekend with you at your home, you can use worship as an opportunity to show them your life's priorities. Let them know that You'd love to have them come to church to worship with you, but if they choose not to, you know, that's okay. Just say you're still going to go, and you'll meet up with them afterwards, and you'll go out and eat at a restaurant somewhere. Instead of allowing all the other circumstances that pop into our lives to overrule our priorities, you know, let us worship the Lord and as God's people, with God's people. Let us decide that we're going to be a witness for God by still going to worship him at the church. And when troubles come upon you and joy seems like it's so far away, you know, those are the times when not only do you need to be in church the most, worshiping together with God's people, but those are the times when your witness can be the strongest. Romans 8, 25 through 27, it puts it like this. But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. <clears throat> In the same way, the Spirit, it helps us. He helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our heart, he knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. When you don't feel like worshiping, when you feel like you've just kind of gone through the roughest week of your life, the Spirit who lives inside of every believer of Christ will lift up prayers to the Father on your behalf for your benefit. And so worship becomes a witness in those tough times because people will say, how is it that they stick with the church? How is it that they continue to be obedient to God? Why do they still read their Bible? You know, when life seems so unfair to them and tough, how come they still stay faithful to God? Well, the reason why we worship God is because he's trustworthy. He's a God who follows through. And when we worship God, it becomes a witness to others that God is good all the time. And all the time, God is what? Good. God is good. He is worthy of our praise. Hebrews 13, verses 14 and 15 says, We do not have an enduring city here, but we are looking for the city that is to come. It's talking about heaven. Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that openly profess his name. So when you sing, 
when you read scripture, when you share your faith, when you love radically, when you give generously, when you grow intentionally, when you serve faithfully, all of these things we do because we're being in an intentional church, all of this becomes part of your worship. And when people see your priorities and they see how you live, your lifestyle of worship, it will become a powerful witness to God's goodness to them. That leads me to the final way you can step up your worship. And that is make sure your worship involves sacrifice. <clears throat> you can't have one without the other. They go hand in hand. The first place that worship is mentioned in the Bible, it is found all the way back in the first book of the Bible in Genesis chapter 22. That is the passage where Abraham is required to sacrifice his son, Isaac. Here's what Genesis 22 1 and 2 says, Sometime later God tested Abraham and he said to him, Abraham. And Abraham replied, Here I am. Then God said, Take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering. And so God tested Abraham. Would Abraham sacrifice his one and only son? Can you imagine the stress of that moment? This is the only son that he's waited decades to have. God said to him, you've got to trust me, be patient. His wife is over 90 years old when she, gets pay, when she gets pregnant, and finally that baby comes. And God makes this promise about him becoming as numerous as the sands of the sea. And now God says, I want you to sacrifice that son why would God say something like that? Why would Abraham even begin to be ready to follow through with this? Well, the New Testament tells us that Abraham reasoned in his mind that God would bring his son back from the dead. And Abraham wanted to worship God. He didn't understand it totally, but he trusted God. Now, as you know, God did, did not allow Abraham to follow through with that sacrifice but this foreshadows the radical love that God would show to us in the New Testament with Jesus when Jesus did not intervene to stop it. You see, God stopped Abraham from bringing that knife down that would slay Isaac. But he didn't stop the Roman soldier from bringing that hammer down to crucify Jesus. He didn't stop when his one and only son was nailed to the cross to pay for all the sin that I would do. Genesis 22.5 gives us that first use of the word worship in the Bible. It says, Abraham said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. <clears throat> we will worship and then we will come back to you. Isn't that interesting? The first place in all of the Bible where we come across the word worship. And it's here at this place of ultimate sacrifice. Worship requires sacrifice. Abraham knew that God knew best. Well, thank you. And that's what worship is. <clears throat> worship is giving God our best. The best that we have. The best of who we are. The best of how we reach out to others. Worship is is about putting God first. Nothing comes before him. Worship is when you say in your heart of hearts, I will not hold anything back from you, Lord. My most treasured possessions, my biggest dreams, my deepest pain, all of them are placed before you, God, as an offering. And perhaps the greatest lesson we can learn this morning about worship is that it will always cost you something. It always does. It just will. In 2 Samuel chapter 24, verse 24, we read of the time when David said, I will not sacrifice to the Lord, my, my God, burnt offerings that cost me nothing. And so it costs you something when you come here on Sunday morning. It costs you time. It costs you energy. It costs you resources. Maybe it costs you time spent with friends. Maybe it costs you in your relationships with your family. Worship might be costly, but we are commanded to do so. Hebrews 10, verses 24 and 25, it says, 
And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day approaching. What is the day that the author is talking about? He's talking about the day of Christ's return. We are closer today to that day than we were last week. And so don't give up coming together. Worship, it is how our spiritual batteries get recharged. And when you're here on Sunday morning, you don't have to wonder whether or not God is here. He's here. When you are in a Bible study, whether it's at home or here at the church, you don't have to wonder if God is going to show up. He's there. And when you're worshiping the Lord and you're singing at the top of your voice, and maybe you lose your voice like I did because I sang a little too loud. <laughs> He's there. God will always show up. Sometimes we respond to God's power with a bowed head and, and reverence. Other times we respond to God's love with an outstretched arm and celebration. Both are biblical. One's not better than the other. But when you worship God, keep in mind that you are worshiping the one in whose image you are made. You are worshiping the one who is the creator of this world. And so we need to give him our worship wherever we are, and at all times. You see, worship is a lifestyle. It's not an event. Worship was never intended to be limited to just an hour on Sunday at this address. In worship, we are refueled, we are recharged, we are refocused. But perhaps one of, one of the greatest reasons for us to gather and worship with one another is this. How can we not do it? In view of God's great mercy, in view of his unfathomable grace, in light of who he is and what he's done for us, how can we not bow in worship and eat and drink in remembrance of Christ? And how can we not gather together to give worship to this one who's so worthy of our adoration? Because you see, worship is about him. It's not about me. That's why we celebrate. That's why we sing. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you and we do adore you and we come this morning before you in all humility, but with thanksgiving on our heart, knowing that you are good and you are gracious. And our prayer is that we would become better worshipers of you, that it would become more consistent, that we would love you more, that we would look around and see you and your presence in our life every day, in every way. May your favor and blessing go with each one here today as we leave this place. And may we go and worship you wherever we go. We love you. We thank you for Christ in whose name we pray. Amen. <laughs>